online. Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm so glad that you're here, whether you're in the room or whether you're on the other side of that screen. The Lord has a message for us today that I'm excited to deliver. I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you've got them with you, to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 20 through 22. Matthew 9, 20 through 22. Wait a minute, Pastor. You're only going to read three verses? <laughs> that didn't sound like you at all. Trust me, there's plenty of message to this. Plenty of message to it. I went back and forth over what to call this thing because I, I, I am human too, and I sometimes worry about what people think more than I, than I should and I know what I wanted to call this message, and I went back and forth. I'm like, if I put that title online, a bunch of super religious people are going to come after me, and they're going to be mean to me, and they're going to make horrible comments to me on, on, on the Facebooks and on the YouTubes and, and on the, t- the tickety talks and the, the Insta Twitters and wherever else people hang out. Um, but I said, you know what, this morning, I, I have to call it what the Lord put in my heart, and I have to just let those people come for me if they do. If you are giving titles to your notes this morning. This message is called Staking Your Claim. (sighs) Yeah, I'm going to cry. I always do. It's okay. There's a reason that's important. Before we even read scripture this morning, Pastor, you said you hadn't been feeling good. Are you sure you're okay to preach? You're going to say something before you read. Yes, I am. Staking Your Claim. Why do we call it this? Why, why am I using that as a title? I want to give you a bit of a history lesson this morning that applies to what we're going to learn. Back in the Old West, the American Old West, if you're like me, I like Westerns. I like the idea of people going out West and them against the elements, and they just get stuff done. And in the American Old West, people did what was literally called staking a claim. They would go out into this unclaimed territory that didn't belong to anyone, and what the American government did... The Homestead Act of 1862 allowed anyone over the age of 21 to go out west and claim 160 acres of land for themselves. They would literally take a stake and they would drive it into the ground and they would measure and mark the land from that stake in every direction to say this is the territory that I've been allotted, that I've been assigned, that belongs to me, that the authority in control says I can have. And then they would go and register that with the claims office, and they would say, this is mine. And once they had done that, they would set up a bank account so they could begin doing business and whatever needed to get done in order to maintain that property. They had the rights to do whatever was necessary related to that property based on the claim that they were given permission to stake. Everything on that claim was theirs everything that it produced, and that claim became their livelihood. It became the provision for everything that they were to do with their life. Their claim, it literally, their life depended upon their maintenance of what they had been given and what they said was theirs, where they had put their stake. It was their source of survival, and they lived a lifestyle according to what that claim provided them. I want to tell you this morning, God has declared that there is a portion of his kingdom that is set aside for you. And it is up to you to begin conducting business based on what he has declared is yours. There are too many people in the kingdom of God that are living spiritually destitute lives because they have yet to begin doing kingdom business based upon the claim that God said, I want you to stake your life on this. The economy of the kingdom of God is not based on our investment. We're not storing up good deeds and earning something from him. The economy of the kingdom of God is based on what God has set aside for us to maintain and withdraw from in his kingdom. We don't have to earn what God has given us. What we do have to do is wisely invest and take advantage of what he has set aside for us. What are you doing to make use of the claim that God has said you have authority to stake in the kingdom of God? That's the message I have for you this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to read from it. And I thank you for the fact that you have shown us how we can continue to apply it today. God, I thank you that it is a living word that is not dead. And for people in the past, it applies to what's going on in our life right now. Lord, I pray as we read the scripture and as we hear the perspective that you've given us on it this morning, that we would be moved to action and moved to obedience regarding what you share with us today. We ask all of these things through the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. If you look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22, this is the passage that the Lord brought to me this week. 
where we pull this theme from. Just then a woman who had suffered from bleeding for 12 years approached from behind and touched the tassel of Jesus' robe. For she had said to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be made well. But Jesus turned and saw her and said, have courage, daughter. Your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made well from that moment. Have you heard this story before? Most of you have. Almost everybody in the room shaking your head yes. If you have not heard it before, it's a great story. There was a woman. No, I'm not going to say it again. You just heard it. (laughs) woman had a medical condition that she had lived with her entire life. The thing that was an issue for her was not just that she was sick, but also this changed the way that she was allowed to live her life. Everything about her existence made her unclean because she was sick. In the Jewish culture, she was not allowed to go to the temple. She was not allowed to be around other people. She was not allowed to have normal relationships with anybody, with family, with friends, with anyone she would want to spend time with. And the reason was because Jewish law said she is unclean because of the issue of blood she's dealing with. This was a woman who'd been sick for a very long time, and all she wanted was to be made well. And the truth is, sure, she wanted to be made well, but what she really wanted was to be able to participate and engage in everything else that she was kept separate from in her life. And this woman, when she heard about Jesus Christ and heard that he was going around and healing the sick, She said, I want that for myself. And she staked a claim by faith that those promises of God were hers and not just for the other people that she had heard about. Now, many of us would say, of course she did. But you have to think this is a woman who for this many years has walked around and not been able to interact with people. We have to think about the, just the actual picture of this story. It says she pushed through the crowd and found the hem of Jesus' garment. Do you know by law she would have been forbidden to be in public? By law, she would have been forbidden to be in that crowd of people. By law, it would have been illegal for her to touch anyone and certainly for her to approach someone the level of importance that Jesus was. Because at this point in Jesus' ministry, he was not quite yet looked down upon by the establishment. He hadn't quite gotten the reputation where the Pharisees were giving him a hard time. He was heralded fairly well even by the authorities. Oh, Jesus is coming. This is an important man. We should give him some space and some time. He would have been protected by law in the same way that a prince or some other important person coming to town would have been. Keep the rabble off of him. He's an important man coming to do important business. And this woman said, I'm not paying attention to any of that. I have staked everything that I have, all of my faith, all of my hope. My entire life is based upon the fact that if I can get to him, it will solve my problem. She staked a claim by faith that the promises of God were hers. She was absolutely confident that he was the only source of her healing and her restoration and that if she could just get to him and just be near enough to him to touch the thread that his robe was made out of, she would get well. But what we also have to realize is how much this woman had lost by trying in her own strength before she sought the Lord. The power of God was more than available before Jesus showed up. The power and the presence of God is well documented throughout all of the Old Testament. The power and the presence of God had been around for thousands of years before Jesus walked the earth. But this woman had, for some reason, not yet gotten the revelation that what God promised me is mine and I can have it. And she had lost a great deal. If you do research on this story and you go back and study the, 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 the other accounts of it that we find in Scripture and start digging into the language and the history, the woman had become, financially, she was in a bad spot. Can you imagine if you got a deadly disease, what would you spend to get well again? The woman had done all the things that she needed to do. She'd spent everything that she had in pursuit of becoming whole. She'd spent it on doctors. She'd spent it on treatments. She'd been traveling to the best places where she could get help. The woman was broke and desperate. Oh, Lord, help me. The woman had become broke and desperate because she was trying to provide for herself something that could only be provided by heaven. She was broke and she was desperate because she had been trying to do it for herself rather than staking a claim on what God had provided for her. 
The source of your inheritance in Christ is not in your ability and in what you can do and in your anointing and in your gifts and in your talents. The source of your inheritance in the kingdom of God is in God's provision alone. Stake a claim on what he has promised you and begin conducting the business of your life based upon that, not upon what I can do. See, this woman's best efforts had still kept her separate from people, separate from God, separate from the temple. Gosh, how much of that does that apply to in my life? How often has me trying to do my best actually gotten me farther from what I wanted because I was doing it with the wrong attitude for the wrong reason at the wrong time in the wrong place? But I'm really good at these things. Why is it not working out for me? Because if it's just my effort, it's not drawing me any closer to the king of kings. This woman's best efforts actually separated her. You see this in church all the time. You have people that will show up and they say, well, I'm good at this. This is my gift. This is my talent. And they try to force themselves into a place of using those things in the kingdom. It's like, but we don't need that. There's not a place for that. This is not the time for that. I can't just show up with my gifts and my talents and my ability and my best effort and expect everything to go well for me. Stretch that out into the rest of the world. People might recognize what I'm good at, but why do I just not have the thing? If you've ever watched those talent shows they have on television, it's like, she's a great singer, but she just doesn't have it. She doesn't have the thing. And then other times you'll watch someone and you go, you know what, she, she's not the best singer, but she's just got a quality. There's something about that person. There's a difference in someone that is just trying so hard to do their best with what they've got and someone that's actually been given the right and the authority to do a thing. And you can see it whether you know what to call it or not. This woman had been using her best effort and she had found herself separated from what she actually wanted most, fellowship with people and fellowship with God. All of that changed when she stopped using her own best effort and she began to draw from Jesus Christ as her resource. Every single bit of that changed when she turned her eyes to Jesus. When she focused on him, suddenly there were a lot of things that she was willing to do she wouldn't even do moments before. Not the least of which is sacrifice her dignity. It says if you read the entirety of the story, she ran through the crowd yelling, unclean, unclean telling people up front, I'm not fit to be around. I'm not good enough. There's nothing about me worthwhile. Declaring as loud as she could to these people the worst thing about herself because it's what she was required to do, but that was not enough to keep her from getting to Jesus Christ. She sacrificed her dignity. She sacrificed her pride and she risked the rebuke of everyone there and every authority around her because none of those things were more important than what Christ had promised her and what she knew she could have if she would just get to him. She defied Jewish law and she approached the Son of God even when she was under the threat of rejection and exile and potentially even of violence because the penalty for forcing uncleanliness on others was death. None of that mattered. What changed? Why was she suddenly willing to stand up to all of that? Because to claim the promise of wholeness that was available nowhere else, it's what was necessary. I will do what I have to do to claim what Christ has said is mine. If we would just approach our lives in the same way. What had changed about this woman can change in us. Once we seek Jesus, we will not selfishly seek to satisfy ourselves. Once we actually seek Jesus, we'll find out that what we're looking for is there a wholeness and a completeness that we can't get anywhere else. What is the thing that's most important to us? We addressed this woman in the beginning and said she certainly wanted to get well. Nobody wants to be sick. Nobody wants to be unwhole. But what we really want, I want the fellowship of people. I want fellowship with God. I want things that make me complete because I'm missing something. Otherwise, I wouldn't be trying to get anything else. If this was enough and I was good with this, I'd be fine. That's true for pretty much everything in life except musical instruments. There's a caveat there where you can always want more of those. And you, My wife doesn't think it's funny. The rest of you are giggling. It's okay. <laughs> There's a promise of wholeness. If I'm seeking Jesus Christ, what I find out is I, I'm seeking something because I'm missing something. And what I want is what Jesus provides me. I want wholeness that I get that doesn't come from the next guitar or the new drum set. 
or the spouse or even getting healing for my sickness or finding the church that I think is perfect or having a new car. There's a wholeness that comes. And there's a reason we're still looking for it. We have to stop selfishly seeking to better ourselves and actually seek the wholeness that we, found, we find in Christ. And we say really well and really often with our mouth. We're really good at saying, oh, well, I am seeking Christ. I do want holiness. I do want to be made whole. I do want the relationship with him. But your actions are what indicate where you place value. We will say Jesus is the most important thing to me, but we don't get up and read the Bible in the morning. We do go work extra hours to buy the thing, though. We don't get up early to read. We won't go to a prayer meeting on a night that there's a ball game. We won't go to a church service on a night when it's the one night I get to relax with my family. We won't set aside time to spend with the Lord while we say with our mouth all day long, he's the most valuable thing, but what's most valuable to me is what makes me feel better and what I enjoy doing. My happiness, my comfort, my human, short-term, temporary satisfaction. Your actions indicate where you place value. We look at the life of this woman and we say, this is what faith looks like. I'm not worried about these other things that might cause me discomfort or even make me look bad. What I care about is what he has said I can have. And I'll get it at any cost. I'll miss the game. I'll have less stuff. I'll sleep less. I'll go to bed earlier. I'll rearrange my schedule because what he's got for me is what matters. That's what faith looks like. And Jesus responds to this woman. He says, woman, your faith has made you whole. Interesting, he doesn't say the good work that you've done has made you whole. The things that you have said and the prayers that you've prayed and the wishes that you have wished upon stars and in fountains. He didn't even say that your hope, I hope one day the Lord will. He doesn't say any of those things. He says your faith, the action that you put to your belief has made you whole whole and complete see this story is not just the story of a sick woman that wanted to be healed this is the account of a woman who found the source of wholeness and she pursued it as if it were guaranteed and here is the issue that the rest of us have for the most part we don't really believe that what Christ has promised us is guaranteed for us well of course he did it for her of course he did it for him of course he did it for you Look at who you are. Look at what you've been through. Look at how, by my estimation, you have earned it. None of us have earned anything. None of my works, none of my deeds, none of my good or bad behavior has made me more or less qualified for what Christ has provided for me. The difference between this woman and many of us is that she staked her entire life and said, if God said it, it's guaranteed, and I will bank and transact business in my life based on that and nothing else. Too many people pursue Christ as if his provision had to be earned or was uncertain. We've got to pursue him with absolute faith that says, no, there's a guarantee. I go to the bank, and I am sure that my money is going to be there. They promised me that it would be. I have more faith in a brick and mortar bank than I have in the God of all creation some days. And I would dare say that many of us are all in that same boat. Too many people pursue Christ as if the provision was uncertain, but we have to pursue him knowing that he absolutely means it and it really is for you. And he really did say, go drive a stake in it and transact business on it and treat it like it's yours and take care of it well. See, wholeness, this idea of being made whole, wholeness is the result, is the result of pursuing God with absolute faith. It's about believing what God said is true and trusting him to provide what he promised. And before we go off in a weird direction, this is not name it, claim it, prosperity gospel garbage. Because the problem with that idea of just claiming what God said as mine is it puts me at the center. It says, this is what I want, so God's going to give it to me. That's not the same thing. I'm not the one that decides what I get. And then God is obligated to make it happen. I can't make myself whole. 
I can't decide what's coming to me. Wholeness is having my mind and my body and my spirit, my emotions aligned with Christ. In fact, that word comes out of the same root as holy. Whole and holy come from the same root word, being made complete. Faith in Christ is going to produce wholeness. It's going to produce holiness. See, holiness means that my emotions don't get out of order when I don't get what I wanted. Holiness means my spirit is not connected to my wants and my wallet anymore. Holiness keeps my thoughts from straying from the goodness of God into poor pitiful me just because I didn't get my way. Jesus gave us this instruction. He said, be holy as I am holy. In fact, it was God that said that in Leviticus in the Old Testament. And just so you don't write that off as some Old Testament idea that's true with the New Testament, he had Peter reiterated in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. He brought the concept forward. So it's the whole Bible is be holy because I am holy. Be holy as I am holy. But God, you're perfect. How can I be like that? It's impossible. Well, God wouldn't tell you to do something that was impossible. And make note before we even explore that any further, be holy as I am holy is not a question. It's not a suggestion. Be holy if you can. Do your best at being holy. Be the most holiest, bestest you can possibly be. That's not what it says. It says be holy as I am holy. He's not asking. It's commandment. It's a statement. But he doesn't ask us to do impossible things. so long as we have his spirit. It is impossible for me by myself. This woman had tried for years to take care of herself, and it hadn't happened. She hadn't been made whole. She had expended everything that she had, and she was empty, and she was broken, and she was still isolated, and the things that she wanted most were still out of her reach until she began to say, Jesus is my source for this. This is where this has to come from. Be whole. I can't except by the power of the Spirit of God living in me. That's the example of Jesus. He lived that way. Jesus Christ lived completely dependent upon the Father for everything he needed to accomplish his, accomplish his work. You look at John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. I have not spoken on my own. This is Jesus talking. He says, I haven't spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command that I should say and what I should speak. I know what his command is. It's eternal life. So the things that I speak, I speak because the Father told me. Jesus had to depend on his Father and on the power of the Spirit. And he had to draw everything from there. And he was Jesus. You may or may not have noticed that you are not Jesus. You may or may not have known. Maybe they won't notice. I am not Jesus. But I have the example of Jesus, and if even he had to do it, then certainly so do I. If our source of provision is truly in Jesus Christ, then the evidence of our faith is our holiness. And this should inform our prayers and our words and our actions in every possible way. Pursuit of the complete and perfect will of God is what will make us whole. And that is what will restore us and supply us to accomplish his purpose. Nothing else. Not what I can do. Look what I can do. That's not going to make me whole. That's not going to fix it. That's not going to give me what I need. What's going to make me whole is what he supplies for me. Verse 22 of the passage that we read. It says, Jesus told the woman, have courage. There's another translation that you can read that says, have complete confidence. Complete, whole, have confidence. Whole confidence or complete faith. Faith. What is that? It's my confidence that his plans are going to be what he says his plans are. You know, you have that person that you call them up and they say they're coming, but you really, until they walk through the door, don't know. And even sometimes when they say they're coming... You tell them that it's from 6 to 8, and they walk in at 7.45. And they're like, oh, you guys started without me. All the pizza's gone. The game's over. You know these people? 
You can't have faith in that. Faith in God, though, he says to have complete confidence in him that he'll do what he says he's going to do. He'll show up when he says he's going to show up. He'll provide what he says he'll provide for. But the, the catch here is that we're, we're, we're trusting him for what he says he provides. We're trusting him for what he says he has in mind. And it's, our, it's wholeness that he has in mind, and we've got to have faith in that. We've got to question ourselves when we say, okay, it seems like God's not coming through in my life. It seems like nothing's working. The question is, are you trusting God to work out your plans, or are you trusting his will to be done? Am I trusting God to do the thing that I had in mind? Or did I listen first to what he had in mind and I'm waiting for that to happen? See, God's provided us everything that's necessary to accomplish his plan for our life. When we come up short is when we're expecting God to provide for our plans. That's where we come up lacking. That's where we come up short. That's where we come up broke and destitute and feeling sorry for ourselves and ending up being alone for years and years and years and incomplete for such a long period of time even though the resources had always been available because I was waiting on God to do my thing rather than me saying I'm willing to do his faith is approaching God with the assurance that he's going to provide what he promised because God provides resources what we often lack in our walk is a vision for what the resources he's provided should accomplish. Sometimes you, maybe you probably don't do this. You're better people than me. But sometimes I look over people's shoulder at what they're doing on their phones. And sometimes I watch them playing a game. And it drives me absolutely batty because I can see that these things are supposed to match. Or that piece should move there. Or how come they don't? And they're just, and then they lose and you're like, Gosh, what, it was right there the whole time. What is wrong with you? you? I don't even play that game, but you play it for hours. How can you not see it when it's right there in front of your face? You, ever, you guys probably don't do that, but I, I do that sometimes. Sometimes what we don't see is what's right in front of our face. And it's because we're looking for the wrong thing. I'm looking for God to do what I expected him to do. And God says, I've given you every resource to do the thing I have in mind for you to do. God provides resources and we need the vision for what the resources we have are meant to accomplish. What happens is we instead struggle and then we get frustrated because he wants to provide direction for us and correction for us. And oh, God's stepping on my toes and he's beating me up and my life is so hard and it seems like all of heaven is against me and I'm fighting. When we're Struggling like that, more than likely, it's not that the Lord is fighting us. It's that we're fighting him. We've got to align ourselves with his purpose because when I'm aligned with the purpose of God, I will see what the provision I have is for. If I'm aligned with the purpose of God, I'll see that the provision that I'm begging him for is actually already here. What I lacked was the understanding of how to use it. This woman had become impoverished and desperate because she was doing everything in her own power to find wholeness and healing on the earth. And her situation, and hear me when I say this, when I say her situation, I'm talking about her isolation and her desperation. I'm not talking about her sickness. I don't mean that she brought the sickness on herself, but I'm saying her condition, the things that she was actually lacking that mattered from an eternal perspective it was the result of using her own resources rather than seeking the resources of God to accomplish what he had in mind. There are too many good Christians that are broken from spending all that they have in pursuit of something other than God's vision for their life. There are too many people who call themselves good Christians that are broken because they've been exercising their faith by pursuing something other than God. They've been pursuing a godly thing or a godly idea or just a good idea that they had. And they're still broken and they're still hurt and they're still desperate and they give up because they're not actually pursuing what God said, I have this for you. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 talks about this. God will bring every act to judgment. One translation says every action into account. 
including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. See, there's an account being kept on our behalf, and it's not the one we're earning with our good deeds. It's the one of what we've done with what God provided for us. The business of the kingdom of God is transacted based upon the claim that God has set aside from you. We withdraw God's resources by faith in what he promised us. And when we begin to look at the kingdom in that way and our life in that way, then we have to ask ourselves, in what area have I really been faithful? Your actions will tell us what's valuable to you. What areas are you faithful in? Your actions demonstrate your faith. You have faith in your job. That's why you get up and go to it every day. You have faith in your intellect. You have faith in your parents. You have faith in your talents. You have things you can look at in your life and say, I can trust these things. Maybe maybe dad's more better at being around than mom is. But you have a person you trust, whether it's a parent or not. There are people you trust and things you trust in, and you invest your time in those places. And when it comes to living for Christ, some of us are investing in good deeds because we're trusting in those. And the Lord says, I want you to trust in me. And the difference is obvious. You can look at the lives of people and see, am I actually trusting the Lord or am I trusting the good that I can do? It's a huge difference. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 reads like this. Don't collect for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, that verse is not just about having a big treasure chest full of stuff. It's not about wealth. It's not about riches in the sense of what we can gather up and accumulate. It's talking about where we expect to receive our provisions from. When God gives you a vision and calls you to something, the work that he's calls you to do, or he calls you to do will be accomplished by using what he provided for you. Is your treasure in what he said, stake your claim on this, or is it in what I thought I earned? God's vision is not going to be accomplished by collecting treasures and earning them yourself. You collect treasure from heaven because the Father already provided it. I didn't have to earn that? No. You mean I... But I thought not sinning and praying and going to church. You're not earning anything with that. You're participating in something that already exists. And if I'm doing what God's asked me to do with my life, I still have access to all of those resources. He set them aside for me. I'm looking at him as a source. God's vision won't be accomplished by what I collect. The treasure has already been set aside for me. The treasure that I need is made available in only one way. I have to submit to his will. Ugh, that's that awful word. Submission. Ooh, say it again. Mufasa, Mufasa, Mufasa. Submission. See, there's not anything that I can give or invest into heaven that is worth anything. My account in eternity and in heaven is about drawing upon what God provided, and my access to it is based upon whether I'm submitted to his will or just doing busy work to try and accomplish it myself the best of my ability. I have to draw upon God's provision. That draw is important because the resources of heaven are meant to be drawn from. I want you to hear this this morning. The resources of heaven are not meant to be saved and stored up and hoarded like some dragon in a cave somewhere. They are meant to be spent and used. How much of what God made available to you have you claimed And how much of it are you drawing out to transact the business that is necessary to do his work in the place that he's given you? How much of it are you actually putting to use for his purpose on the earth? See, we're not talking about money. We're talking about heaven's resources. What are you doing for the kingdom of God? What are you drawing that he's invested in you so that you can put it somewhere? We worry about storing up so much. We talk about going to the bank and wanting them to have our money. I don't have to worry about God running out of something, so why am I scared of doing something with what he gave me? When we do things of our own will and our strength, we're definitely going to run out of our own will and our own strength. The other thing, though, 
that's far worse than the idea that I'm going to burn out or get tired or eventually not have what it takes anymore. What's worse than that is the idea that when I'm drawing from my own strength and my own talent and my own ability, I'm leaving in a balance in an account that God told me I want you to drain it. I'm leaving a balance in the account that God said, spend it all if you can. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father. On that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, depart from me, you lawbreakers. I never knew you because we're so busy doing busy work that we're drawing from our own strength and our own ability and our own ideas and our own talents. And we're not pulling from the account that God said, this is yours, transact business with it. Dry it out if you can. Test me in this, says the Lord. We'll get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. What's the will of the Father? That we trust him when he says the resources to do his work are available. What's the will of the Father? That we actually depend on him and allow him to provide for his purpose to be accomplished. That we draw on his power of strength, power and strength and trust that it's not going to run out. That's the will of your Father. Not just that we be good little Christians. The will of the Father is that we actually do his work by drawing his resources that he set aside and said, this is yours if you'll claim it. We're not stockpiling treasures in eternity. We're drawing upon a limitless supply to do an eternal work. See, Jesus, we read that he went to prepare a place for us. He went and did that before we ever did a thing. The place was prepared. I don't need to be storing up for retirement. Heaven is not my eternal resting place in the sense that I need to make sure I've got a nice house and a forever home and a nice piece of property I'm going to. The Lord's done that. It may be the location in the presence of God where I get to hang out that's mine, but I'm not having to send resources ahead and save up and invest well for that to happen. God set that place aside for me before I ever did a thing for him. What he told me to do was draw from the resources of heaven to do the work while you're here. God's not building anything based upon my performance. He's built it based on his love for me. And it's already done. See, the economy of heaven is based on how am I investing what he supplied me. Success in the kingdom is measured by how well I spend and invest what he made available to me by his spirit while I'm here. See, there's another story. I don't have time to get into it this morning, but Matthew 25 tells the parable of the talents. Three people given certain amounts of money, and two of them did a great job. They invested it well, earned more money, and when the master came back that loaned them the money, he got his money back plus some. The third guy dug a hole in the ground and hid the money there and came back and just handed the master that coin. And the master said, why would you do that? You didn't do anything worthwhile with what I gave you. And he called that servant wicked. But to the others, he said, well done, good and faithful. Well done, good and faithful servant is spoken to the ones that actually do something with the resources that the master gives them. The people that actually invested according to his plan. It's those people that God is rewarding out of his treasury. See, God's economy is far different than we imagine. It's not about money changing hands or favors and blessings being traded for good behavior. It's about what are we doing with what God provided us. God's economy is about establishing a kingdom of faith, and faith doesn't create a culture of selfish seekers. What do I get out of this? What blessings and what title and what honor and what anointing and what wonderful things can I do that people will praise me for? That's not what faith creates. Faith also doesn't create a, a, a bunch of foolish givers while I'm just constantly throwing everything out everywhere and just it's making it rain all the time for anybody that can catch it. It's, there's something more to it than that. What faith does when it's applied properly is it establishes a culture of trust in Christ that moves beyond just me. It means that people see the way I trust him and they come to trust him as well. Real faith means I'm investing the resources of the kingdom in a way that the kingdom is growing because of what I'm doing with what he's given me. We got really big with that concept, but let's bring it all the way back down to an individual for a minute. Do you trust the Lord? Do you believe and have you staked your claim in the things that he has actually said belong to you? Do you trust the Lord when he says he loves you? Really? Do you believe he loves you? 
not some big cosmic blanket of an idea that God loves all people. God loves you. Do you believe he actually cares about you and what happens to you? Do you believe he's actually going to provide what you need to do the things that you need to? From your power bill to how it is you're going to witness to people. To how it is you're going to do the thing that God's put in your heart that you're scared to tell anybody. Because it seems too big and they'll probably tell me I'm dumb and who do I think I am? Do you trust him? Are you staking your claim on that? Do you really believe it's yours and are you living accordingly? Are you drawing upon those promises that he gave you at the moment of your salvation? Or are you trying to draw your existence from somewhere else? When you see a need, whether it's in your own life or whether it's somewhere else, are you seeking God to fulfill it? Do you have faith that he's going to come through? Or are you simply trying to meet those needs with your own money and your own time and your own hard work and your own wisdom and your own talent and your own experience? Where are you drawing your resources from? Lord, Lord, we did this work in your name. Did you? We're doing nothing for the kingdom of heaven if we're doing it with our own resources. See, the evidence of our lack of faith lies in the overstuffed coffers of heaven. I provided this and it's still here. Why have you not used it? The Lord wants you to use what he's given you. We've got to stop wasting time trying to fill up an eternal bank account with good deeds and start drawing from the provision that God gave us to accomplish his purpose because that purpose is great. You want miracles? You want the power of God? Stop asking God for stuff and start asking him what you should do with what you have. That's when we can be assured that the provision is coming. When we're doing his work, we have access to all the provision of heaven. That's what absolute faith in the gift of God looks like. It's faith in his ability to make good on everything that he's promised. And that's what it looks like. Lord, what do I need to do with what I have? Lord, what do I need to do even in my lack, trusting that you'll provide? Where do I need to step out and say, even though I don't feel like I have it, I'm going to give it a shot because you said to. I've watched some of you do that. It's fascinating. It's so encouraging. The work of the Holy Spirit is what's, what, what's going to empower you to do that. And it's not going to be because you begged for it. It's going to be because you actually submitted to him. You're going to accomplish the great work of the kingdom of God and see miracles and power and salvation and healing and things you can't explain. It's going to happen when we start drawing day by day from the resource he's set aside to do his work. We submit <laughs> that word. Submission is how we figure it out. Well, how can I do that if I've still got a life to live? Submission to Christ will help you balance all of those things. You can balance your home life and your job and your anointing and your calling and how are you going to discover who you are in Christ instead of who people say you are. All of that comes and balances just fine if you're submitted to the Lord. Works a whole lot better. None of it comes from your own mind or talent or through testing or from human evaluation. Submission to God is not the last resort. It should be the first stop that you make. Submission is not a backup plan. Submission is how we begin to draw upon those resources. People of God, this morning, if you call yourselves messengers of the gospel of Christ, submit to his will and demonstrate your expectation in his resources not failing you. That's what the economy of heaven looks like. Submission gives us the full expectation that heaven's resources are not just sufficient, but they're actually abundant. We see this verse in Malachi 3.10 that applies to so many other things. It would bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food. Test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. This is not a message about tithing and about bringing your money to the church. This is the concept of the Lord saying, test me with something tangible so I can prove the resources are supernatural. It's not about the money. It's about trusting the Lord because God is so sure about what he's made available to you. He says, I will prove my faithfulness to you in something you can see so that when the day comes that I ask you to have blind faith, you'll have a foundation to trust me. This morning, my question is this. Where are you drawing the resources to do God's work? Are you trusting just in yourself 
or are you actually trusting the promise of what God provided for you? Because God has made you some promises and you've got to step up and claim them. And the only way you'll do it is by submitting completely to his will for your life. We've got to stop building our own storehouses and start drawing from the economy of heaven. Submit to the will of God and be made whole again. Begin to draw on the account that God established in his work for you. I'm coming to a close. If you'll stand with me, I'm going to finish with this this morning. There's one other thing about those settlers. I talked to you about the Homestead Act when we started this morning. What does it mean to stake your claim somewhere? Put a stake in the ground. Measure. Decide where those borders are. 160 acres, however you want to cut it up from that stake. Open a bank account. Start transacting business. Behave as if it's yours because you've been given rights and authority there. The other thing about those settlers, once they had claimed their land, the other thing the law gave them a right to do, Lord, help me. The other thing the Lord gave them, the, the law gave them the right to do was defend it. And once they had driven their stake into the ground and said, yes, I will lay claim to this. And here's where my borders are. And here's the territory that I have. This is the authority that I have over it. And they go to the bank and they begin to transact business based on the resources of what's been provided for them and where they've staked their claim. The next stop almost every one of them made was to buy a gun to defend what they had been entrusted with so that it would not be stolen from them and used for a purpose other than they intended it to be used for. Perhaps you are somebody who has properly staked your claim on the word of God. This morning I'm here to tell you that if you've already staked that claim, you have a right to defend it. To make sure that the resources God has given you are not being used poorly. That the area and territory he's promised to you is not being improperly invested in something other than the kingdom. Some of you this morning, as I, as I begin to close, you're going to realize, or you've already realized, I need to stake my claim in heaven. But some of you simply need to realize I've got to start defending what I've been given. Some of you need to hear that it's time to defend and fight for what God's promised you, that you have a right to do that. Maybe the enemy's been stealing it from you. Maybe he's been causing you to forget the rights that you have to what God provided. Maybe you've been driven by fear and by frustration to try and store up and collect some earthly things and supplement with those. But the Lord says this morning, you have your father's promise. You have the right to everything that I have given you and you have the right to defend it so that it is used for my glory. Don't allow something that is less than holy to make you less than whole this morning. Defend what God has given you. If you're someone who's not been defending your ground, then repent and move your focus back to the vision that he gave you and the resources that he's provided for it. Reclaim this morning what God has set aside for you. And if you've never made that claim this morning, will you drive a stake in the ground and claim the promise of heaven for your life? Stake your claim upon the provision of God and nothing less. Seek it with all of your heart. Withdraw from it liberally for the sake of his kingdom and defend it as if your life depends upon it. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, I thank you today for your word and for your perspective. I thank you, Lord, for the claim that you have given us to a piece of the kingdom of God. I thank you, Father, for all that you have provided. I thank you for the direction and correction of your spirit this morning to remind us of the resources you've made available. Father, I thank you even for showing us the places where we have not defended it well. I thank you, Father, that you're showing us this morning that it's time to actually defend what you've promised. I pray that by the power of your spirit this morning, we would begin to live and act and behave based upon what you have entrusted us with. That we would begin drawing and transacting business based upon what you have set aside for us. And Father, that we would live our lives as if it depends upon it that we get to you and do your will and draw from what you've set aside. Father, give us the strength, the awareness, the wisdom, the discernment that is necessary to maintain what you've set aside. Give us the courage to draw from the account. Give us the courage to take you up on the offer to try and spend all that you've set aside for us in your kingdom's currency. Forgive us where we have failed. Strengthen us where we have become weak. Give us vision 
for the provision that you've already put in our hands. We ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. And now keep us safe as we go. Bring us back here at the next time that you would have us be together. Keep us safe until then. And while you do that, show us every opportunity we have to put into practice what you've taught us this morning. Amen. And amen. Thank you for being here today. It's good to be with you. I look forward to seeing you again soon.